Now it's time to warmly welcome Ruben Laukkonen, today's speaker. Uh, Ruben Laukkonen is at the moment principal investigator and lecturer at Southern Cross University in Australia. Uh, this is also why we are having this webinar at this time of the day, <laughs> because there is such a time difference. Uh, yeah, Ruben is a researcher in the field of cognitive science and focuses on such fascinating topics as insights, meditation and psychedelics, uh, I would say in pretty insightful ways. Uh, and Ruben, you have published both empirical and theoretical work. Uh, as a philosopher, I especially found the theoretical work like really awesome. A lot of it utilizes predictive processing paradigm and has like really elegant articulation of our current scientific understanding of altered states and fundamental changes in our models of reality in insights and other similar processes. Uh, yeah, maybe also interesting to know that you have also extensive personal background in contemplative practices. Mm, yeah, and now it's your time for the lecture and you can, of course, give more uh, introduction about yourself if you want. Yeah, thanks a lot for coming here. Thanks and kiitos. That's, uh, I think that's plenty about me. It's, it's really wonderful to be here and especially to be giving a uh, talk to my Finnish um, family uh, over there. Mä puhun kans vähän suomea, mutta en ihan tarpeeksi, että te tekisin tai koko selityks suomeksi. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's my pleasure to be here. And I, I want to talk to you today about psychedelics insight and the pursuit of truth. Um, it's, it's going to be a pretty high level talk. Uh, I want to give a kind of integrative view of the research I've been doing on insight um, and then how this relates to uh, psychedelics and then what that means for the pursuit of truth, epistemology. Um, not a philosopher, but I'm, I'm interested in how we can come to know what is what is really true and, and helpful uh, in the world and, and about the mind and about who, who we really are. Just a bit of context as well that I am recovering from a flu, um, so I might stop and mute and, and cough a little bit. Uh, just uh, bear with me uh, if that happens, but hopefully um, it doesn't. <laughs> so here's the structure of today's presentation. I'm going to start by introducing you to the topic of insight. So many people haven't heard, or, um, or at least they don't know that this is an area of research for the past um, well over a century, actually. Uh, and it's it's a fascinating phenomenon. I think it's something, um, I always thought it was something truly mysterious about the mind that it can have these kind of non-linearities, these sudden, sudden revelations. And what that is, um, I think tells us a lot about uh, the potential of humans to, to transform and change. Part two will be about uh, psychedelics or um, particularly about insight in the context of psychedelics and work um, on on insight and then our recent theoretical work on insight and, and psychedelics and then I'll, I'll connect all of this to uh yeah this idea of truth so beginning with insight so uh the first um experiments on insight that i'm aware of was conducted by wolfgang kohler back in 1925 uh, and surprisingly it was conducted on apes uh, and chimps in particular. So Wolfgang Kohler and his colleagues would set up some interesting insight problems for these um, uh, chimps to solve. So for example, there's a bunch of crates here scattered on the ground, uh, but there's also some bananas hanging uh, up above out of reach. And so the chimp needs to somehow, you know, use these crates in order to, to reach the banana. And what the uh, experimenters observed is that Initially, the chimp didn't seem to make any progress. It didn't seem to know what to do with these um, with these crates. But then, seemingly out of nowhere, uh, the chimp would have an insight experience. And you could see this from the outside. You know, it's, it's as if the lights turned on with the chimp. The chimp starts stacking the crates. Uh, and then 
uh, reaches the banana. So immediately as that insight happens, the chimp seems to know what to do and, and starts pursuing this you know, set of actions that allow it to, to reach the bananas. And they observed this over and over again. Other examples were that they had some sticks laying around um, and the chimps would figure out, for example, that they can pole vault up to get up the, to the bananas. So the gestalt psychologists of the time, um, Wolfgang Kohler was one of them, um, became fascinated by this, this, what they called insight learning. Um, and they contrasted insight to a gradual process of problem solving where you, you know, step by step work, work through a problem um, to sudden learning, this insight experiences where the solution comes out of nowhere. It's as, as if it appears to you, uh, you know, from the void or, or um, kind of mysteriously. And, and that's what we call uh, insight. So I'm just going to pull out a few um, key lessons from, from the research. And one of those is that insights are preceded by restructuring of beliefs. Um, or uh, as the Gestalt psychologist would call it, restructuring of the Gestalt. And so that's a bit like this uh, with uh, what you experience with ambiguous images. So if, when you first see this image, what you first probably experience is uh, that you see a frog. Um, but without changing anything about the image, um, just flipping it, um, you can see that there's also a horse. And of course, you could see that even if I didn't flip it. But the point here is that without changing anything about the actual state of the world, you can just restructure your representations and have kind of mini insight experiences. So they were very interested in these bistable illusions uh, as well. And about this, uh, Henry Poincar, the mathematical, the mathematician, he said that the genesis of mathematical creation is a problem which should intensely interest the psychologist. It is the activity in which the human mind takes, seems to take least from the outside world, in which it acts or seems to act only of itself and on itself, so that in studying the procedure of geometric thought, we may hope to reach what is most essential in man's mind. And the key here is that uh, Henry Poincar is highlighting that the mind can work of itself on itself to come up with new solutions. That's why we can have insights while we're in the shower, while we're falling asleep or stepping on a bus or whatever we're doing, insights can, can happen because the mind can somehow restructure its representations without taking in new information. Insight also has a distinct and sometimes powerful phenomenology, it has a powerful feeling uh, about it. To illustrate, Andrew Weil is also another mathematician, discovered the solution to Fermat's last theorem in 1994. Um, and he said, uh, this is from a YouTube video, he said, at the beginning of September, I was sitting here at this desk when suddenly, totally unexpectedly, I had this incredible revelation. It was the most important moment of my working life. Nothing I ever do will again will. And he fights back tears and, and says, I'm sorry. So insight moments can be powerful, they can be intense, they can be life-changing uh, in some cases. And of course, they can also be uh, much smaller, like the kind of insights we, we create in the lab. But some of the consistent phenomenology identified in the lab uh, are as follows. So this quality of confident, confidence, truthiness, this noetic or sense of obviousness, it immediately feels true. And there's also positive affect, so it's pleasurable, it's satisfying, and, and you feel happiness and relief to having found this uh, solution. Of course, some insights are can be dark or negative, and so then you, you might not have this uh, same response. They're also sudden, uh, surprising, and, and you could say metacognitively unpredictable. That is, the subject doesn't know when uh, the insight is going to emerge. They also invoke a sense of drive or inspiration or readiness to act. It's almost as if the insight experience is this line in the sand that lets the organism know that this is the correct solution or good enough solution that I should act on this. I should speak this out. I should, I should select this idea. Insights also tend to be true, um, but they can also be false. So fortunately, insights tend to be true because if they weren't, then we'd be uh, in a very state, um, but which is that, for example, insights um, represent various different kinds of problems, 
across basically all of them, when participants report an insight, these are the blue bars, they tend to be uh, more accurate on average than when they reach the solution through some other more analytic kind of conscious and deliberate uh, approach. And that the size of that effect can kind of change a little bit depending on the problem. Uh, but despite that, um, you can also see that even with inside experiences, there's a proportion of those that are false. Um, so participants also have have do have false insights about some between 10 to 20 percent of the time, even with these very concrete problems. So you can imagine that when we're dealing with a much more complex uh, world, especially in complex states of mind, uh, the the veracity of these insights could um, could get even worse. Let's say, and, and we'll we'll talk a lot about that later. Um, and so we've extended this work on the feeling of insight and its accuracy to, to capture it in an embodied way. So we suggest that it's not enough to just ask participants, did you have an insight? Because this has all sorts of confounds, right? They might just be calling insights those problems which they're really confident about and so on. And so what we did is we used a highly sensitive measure of hand grip strength um, and measure their problem solving progress over time by having them communicate their feelings through this dynamometer. And then if they had an insight experience, we told them to just give it a full strength squeeze immediately as it happens, or just to embody their insight experience through this dynamometer. And what we found is that when participants reported these spikes in the dynamometer, their solutions were much more likely to be correct than when they didn't, so similar to when they self-report them. Um, but not only that, we found that the how intense the insight was, the harder they squeezed the dynamometer. And we didn't tell them to do that. They just unconsciously or naturally embodied the intensity of the insight. And that natural embodiment predicted the accuracy of their solution. So it's, it's again, suggesting that somehow this, the feeling itself has a function. It carries information. It's somehow telling the um, mind something about the epistemological state of the world, which I think is, is really fascinating. We also wondered, of course, since false insights do exist, can we create false insights? Um, I mean, we know, we know, of course, that false insights are happening. They're happening to all of us. We've all had false insights uh, in, our, in our life at some point. And of course, in cases of things like schizophrenia or psychosis or delusional beliefs, false insights are, are, are deeply problematic and, and also very common. But we wondered, can we create false insights in the lab uh, based on uh, some of that theoretical work I'll, I'll describe soon? We expected that we could do this. Um, and uh, indeed, <laughs> we were able to. This was led by a PhD student, uh, Hilary Grimmer, in our lab. Um, and we elicited false insights using semantic priming. So the way that we did this is we primed participants with a list of words. In this case, just with this example, we used um, words related to gardening in particular. So you, you prime the participant with things like plants, grass, farmer, soil, gloves, nursery, and so on. Then you present them with anagrams to solve. Now I just want to focus you on this primed lure condition because that's the key condition. So this is the anagram we presented them with right here. So you might already have an idea of what that is. The true answer to this one is in fact in danger. However, we made it statistically look like Gardener and we also primed Gardener using this, uh, this list of gardening primes um, in order to try to bias their insights towards saying that this word is gardener, even though it's not, it's missing an extra R, for example. And we did this with many different kinds of examples with many participants. Um, and it did, what we found is that in the primed lower condition, participants experience much more false insights. So this is on the y-axis, is the proportion of false insights. So some participants 100% of the time in these primed lowers experience false insights, but mo most of them uh, experience them most of the time. <clears throat> So we, insights tend to be accurate, they can be false, and we've elicited these false insights in the lab. But there's another thing that's interested me a lot, which is the fact that insights seem to drive our decisions and actions, just like that monkey or that chimp knew what to do once it's, uh, it had that insight experience. When we have these insights, we feel like we know what to do. We feel like we've reached the knowledge uh, that we've been searching for, and we're ready to act and decide based on that. So insights also arise from change, from this restructuring of beliefs, but we proposed that they can also cause change. So there's this 
bottom up part of it, which is the emergence of insight, but there's also this top down part that was basically ignored um, by insight research for the last century, which is what happens after the insight? What impact is that insight having on the, uh, on the organism? And think about that in the context of psychedelics as well. When you're having those profound insight moments, and, and that's what these participants report, what impact is that having on them? That's where really it seems to be that the the, the powerful this um, we we designed a few experiments to test whether we could make the insight experience spread out beyond the content in which it arose to irrelevant content. And so in this paper, it's called The Dark Side of Eureka, Artificially Induced Aha Moments Make Facts Feel True. So here we artificially induced insight experiences alongside claims, and we thought that maybe we could make those claims feel true by doing that at the same time. So we did this in a very basic and simple way. So for example, in this, uh, we presented them with claims like this. So you have an anagram here that they need to solve in bold, uh, is the lightest of all metals. So the participant tries to solve this anagram. The solution is, uh, in fact, lithium. And at the same moment as they solve that anagram, they can have a little insight experience. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. We ask them. Um, and we expected that by having this little insight experience with this anagram, the insight experience would actually spread out and affect their interpretation of whether this claim is in fact true. I hope that makes sense. So we're thinking that this insight experience is going to be misattributed to this, uh, to this claim. Uh, and indeed, what we found is that when there was no aha experience, uh, truth ratings were about average because half of the claims were true, half were false. Um, but when there was an aha experience in solving the anagram, the participants were more likely to believe that it was true, even if it was uh, not true. And we also found the effect for simply solving this anagram, but the biggest effect is if an aha experience occurred. Then we wondered if we could have this get the same effect, but with something more important, which is worldviews, things like free will is uh, an illusion, it is useless to pursue justice, people's core qualities are fixed. So fundamental kind of worldviews about people and um, uh, nature and politics. We did the same task and just wondered if we could make those worldviews uh, seem more true by eliciting these tiny little inside experiences. And, in, and indeed, we we, we succeeded in doing that, and we had um, over 4,500 participants in, in, this, in this study and, and uh, several experiments. So this quote nicely highlights what I'm getting at here um, uh, with the misattribution of insight experiences. So the mathematician Nobel laureate John Nash was asked why he believed that he was being recruited by aliens uh, to save the world. He said that the ideas I had about supernatural beings came to me the same way that my mathematical ideas did. So I took them seriously. So John Nash, a kind of genius mathematician, faces the same problem that we all face. We somehow need to know whether our ideas are true or not, or our new perspective is, is useful or not, just based on the feelings that, that we have to go on. Um, and that feeling is is prone to error. So John Nash was was eventually diagnosed with schizophrenia and admitted that he was not really being um, uh, spoken to by supernatural beings. But uh, these ideas came to him exactly like his mathematical ideas did, with presumably this uh, feeling of truth, this feeling of insight. And um, you know, I can I can really sympathize that he he trusted that feeling, given how well it's worked for him in the past. So that's just a bit of background on insight and uh, just a few of the studies that we've done. So moving on now to how, how to think about this in the uh, context of psychedelics. So a lot of researchers have been interested in um, the role of insight in psychedelics, and I, I won't uh, review all of those studies, and this is perhaps not all of them anyway. Um, but a few kind of key takeaway messages from this research is that psychedelics seem to increase the quantity of insights that people um report. It also seems to increase the intensity of insight experiences. And importantly, insights are absolutely key for therapeutic progress and seems to be one of the best predictors of therapeutic success, whether it's uh, for treatment resistant depression or addiction or many other things. Um, and it also predicts uh, changes in beliefs, at least there's uh, some um, growing evidence that that's, uh, that's the case.
so we've started to do some research uh, uh, here and um one one of these uh, was was this initial review called restructuring insight an integrative review of insighted problem solving meditation psychotherapy delusions and psychedelics because all of these fields all of these domains of human action you could say involve powerful moments of insight and these powerful moments of insight seem to play a, a critical role they play a critical role in solving problems they're critical for progress in, in meditation and you know that's all I'd, talk I'd, I'd like to get into um also in psychotherapy in, in the emergence of delusions and as as we now see in, in psychedelics and we see a lot of similarities across these domains uh, but also some differences but you can also see that in the case of for example psychedelics you know you're kind of have getting all of these you 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 sometimes you're doing some problem solving sometimes you're doing some meditation on psychedelics sometimes you're doing psychotherapy and sometimes you're also probably encountering some uh, more, more delusional kinds of uh, epiphanies as well so they're they're highly intermixed and i think it's 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 really important that we begin to yeah look at cross disciplinary um uh way uh, at insight and not just these kinds of toy problems which of course i've been working on a lot but uh uh, my my vision has always been to think about things like uh, mystical experiences and you know the, the profound insights that I've experienced and I'm sure many of you have uh, even though I'm working with these very kind of controlled um, uh, scenarios. Um, this was also a great paper that uh, I, I think spoke really um, wisely on the topic of of insight by Chris Timmerman and colleagues. Um, and, and they noted the following, patients primed to believe that everything they see or feel will be the truth may feel preoccupied by any strange or upsetting revelations they might encounter. At the same time, trusting the inner healing intelligence is a foundational principle in many models of psychedelic therapy. And the frequent experience of patients and therapists alike is that insights received do hold some important realness and are coming from a place of deep knowing. How to hold this space of gentle agnostic respect for the messages that arise is one of the challenges of psychedelic therapy. And I think that's exactly right. There's obvious value in these insights. But if we take all any kind of insight that emerges in our, uh, in our consciousness to be true, then this can be extremely powerful uh, for changing the system, as we'll soon see. But if those insights are actually damaging or false or a delusional, how do we hold those lightly and how do we deal with that situation? Um, um, how, do we, how, how do we kind of deal with the epistemic hygiene uh, of the situation? So now moving on to how psychedelics actually trigger insight experiences. So why do psychedelics lead to more insight experience? I think this is a question that we still you know, need to think deeply about, and you can get increasingly nuanced answers to it. But I think this is a paper that probably most people here are familiar with, and I think it is a is a really good start in giving us some idea of what the mechanisms of of psychedelics are. Um, and what is basically proposed by Robin Carhart Harris and Carl Friston is that uh, psychedelics uh, temporarily flatten the kind of uh, priors, um, the strength of of, of priors, uh, the strength of past beliefs, especially uh, those at uh, higher order levels of uh, higher levels of abstraction in the mind. Um, and, and this precise mechanism is um, around the 5-HT2A receptor, which is find it found at higher levels of, of the cortex and that um, the psychedelics basically add noise at those higher levels of, of the cortex, which means that the um, basically the bottom up input is less filtered. And that's why it's called the anarchic brain because the bottom up input of the world and the body suddenly can kind of get through the beliefs of the mind that would normally be kind of holding up a kind of epistemological um, filter towards them. Instead, the world is now kind of impinging on the senses and the mind uh, unfiltered by past experience, especially to do with the self um, and these higher order beliefs. So this leads to more insight experiences, of course, because if you're not filtering based on your existing beliefs, you're simply open to seeing the world from any perspective, then your perspective is gonna shift a lot. And if your perspective shifts a lot, then you're getting a lot of new, new ways of looking at reality, new ways of looking at the input that's emerging. And by definition, when you shift perspectives, have these restructuring, you have an insight experience because you're seeing information uh, in, a, in a completely new light. Uh, and, and this is uh, 
quintessentially kind of recipe for for insight. So even if you don't buy into the exact uh, mechanisms here, um, what you can probably happily admit is that the, the, the we, or we can happily agree on is that the psychedelic state elicits a period of acute plasticity. So that there, there's a moment where the system is somehow more liberal to change. I, th I think that's clear from the fact that they work in terms of therapy, their work on things like treatment or de resistant depression, their work on um, uh, addictions, um, and, and the fact that you can, uh, you know, almost apply them to any issue, they, they seem to be able to manifest change. Um, and that we can call a, a acute plasticity. I think that is that is fair to say. And just by virtue of having a, acute plasticity, you're going to get more insight experiences. Indeed, it's kind of via the insight experience that the change in the organism happens. It's like the insight experience is the line in the sand. It's really the, the phenomenological marker of transformation uh, within the system. All right, so let's uh, uh, bring this all together with, uh, with some theory. So it was just a few days ago, um, uh, this paper came out, which I'm super happy about. I've been working on this for, I don't know, five years or something like this. Um, and it's a huge paper, so I'm, I, uh, I, <laughs> I'm proud of anyone that, um, you know, really gets stuck into it and, and reads the whole thing. Uh, but, but I hope you do, and I hope you send me your feedback. And um, yeah, and anyway, it's called Insight and the Selection of Ideas. And um, we try to come up with a cognitive and uh, neurocomputational explanation of insight, let's say. Um, we were kind of ambitious with it, and um, we, we, we wanted to give a, an explanation at multiple levels of analysis because I really uh, believe that any good explanation for any phenomenon is going to need explanations at multiple levels. It's not going to be enough to reduce it to reduce everything to bi biochemistry or neurons or atoms or what have you, or even social psychology or cognition. I think we need to think uh, across multiple levels. And so there's also a kind of simple version of the theory, and then it gets kind of m more complex as we go. But I'll start with the simple version, and that is um, simply called the Eureka heuristic. And so all the experiments that I described earlier were based on on, on this theory. It's just that the Series. The preprint was out a while ago, but the publication came after we managed to get the evidence that we we needed. Um, and what I mean by Eureka heuristic is that the the feeling of insight. We we have this stream of consciousness. We have all of these contents of consciousness appearing in our minds, seemingly from out of nowhere. We don't know where our thoughts come from. We don't know where our ideas come from. We don't know why our perspectives change. They they happen to us, right? And the metacognitive mind, the part of us that is aware, or especially the part of us that's aware and aware, that where that it's aware and, and is monitoring what's happening in our own minds, needs some way to tell which ideas to select, which ideas are reliable and which ideas are likely to be true. So within this space of um, the mind, we propose that the feeling of insight, this noetic quality, this feeling of knowing and obviousness is basically highlighting the things that appear in our consciousness that are likely to be true or likely to be valuable and adaptive given our prior learning and given the current, current context that we're in. And so the feeling of insight is a kind of heuristic way of selecting ideas. It's a shortcut. It's a way for us to use our prior learning to quickly select ideas from the stream of consciousness, you could say. So that's the simple version. We heuristically use the feeling of insight to select ideas for adaptive action in uncertain contexts. The world is a very uncertain place and we don't have time to do cost-benefit analysis. So instead we rely on this feeling of insight. Now to unpack the mechanisms, uh, of course, I, uh, because of my experience with these models and, I, and I'm a big fan of them, um, I use predictive processing and, and active inference. Um, and if, if you're not familiar with those models, I'll, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, um, but, but for those who are, I want to uh, briefly mention it. So here's, here's how the mechanisms look. So the initial unconscious work that underlies uh, an insight, um, so insights always emerge after some implicit processing. There's an enormous amount of evidence for this. We propose that this occurs through fact-free learning or Bayesian reduction. So this is really carefully defined by Carl Friston and, and his colleagues, but in, in kind of 
simple terms. It's it's a way that the system, again, how uh, Henry Poincar put it, where the, where the mind works of itself on itself. It basically just uses the information it has to select the simplest models. So it's basically using, for example, mechanisms like um, uh, synaptic pruning to simplify its existing models. And through this process of parsimony, it selects the best models it has for the data it already has, right? It already has all this data and it just uses um, uh, this process of pruning to reach more and more refined vision of a, a more and more refined vision of what it already knows. And this unconscious work um, uh, that can be explained in terms of neural mechanisms quite well, and they also showed it in terms of computational mechanisms, eventually leads to what looks like sudden learning episodes. Because if you arrive on a new model that is more parsimonious, this is an immediate restructuring, uh, which leads to an insight. Okay, so that's part one. This leads to um, the content of the insight, and we propose that this is an ascending metacognitive prediction error. Okay, so at a metacognitive level, again, you're not, sh you don't know uh, where these ideas are coming from, and you have a certain set of expectations metacognitively at this higher order level. When this implicit work leads to an insight, it leads to a prediction error at a higher order level. And this surprises us metacognitively, leading to that sense of, oh, wow, surprise, aha. Um, and, and this is, a, uh, we propose an ascending prediction error up the levels of the hierarchy of the mind. And so this surprises metacognition. And there's some, some, some good evidence with this uh, for, for, from, for example, ERP uh, work um, and, and some also other uh, interesting work on in the timing domain. Um, then we also have the feeling of the insight. So that's the content of the insight is the prediction error, but we also have the feeling of the insight. And we propose that this is... Uh, uh, and a second order inference known as precision weighting or specifically dopaminergic modulated precision weighting. So this prediction error is inferred to be reliable given prior learning and context this mechanism of precision weighting. And, you know, I could go on about this forever, but precision is a ridiculously like almost perfect fit for the feeling of insight because precision reflects uh, attentional capture it reflects confidence, um, and it's also uh, associated with the, the dopamine firing, as, I, as I've just said here. And so, of course, any kind of dopaminergic activity is, is pleasurable and creates that sense of drive. It creates that sense of confidence and, and so on. And precision weighting is basically a um, inference about the quality or the reliability of new information, which is what we're proposing that Insight uh, is doing. Okay, so this that's a really dense part uh, of the talk, but you can you can... Yeah, read into that there, but basically there's this Eureka heuristic and, and there's some mechanisms for it. Um, and I won't explain the whole figure from the paper here. I just want to zoom in on this little part so you can see, and I'll talk about that later as well, but you can see how what I've just described in, in this figure, you know, you, you have at the basic input or sensory level, you're working on a kind of pure, pure raw input here with, you know, there's, there's nothing there at the base input level. I But at a higher order level of representation, you can extract uh, levels of meaning. You can extract new meaning. And for example, see that there's a Dalmatian dog. And, and, and we propose that this is through Bayesian reduction, leads to the recognition of this Dalmatian dog, which leads to higher order prediction errors, which if it has high precision, you get a feeling of insight. Ah, uh, it's a Dalmatian dog. So that's a lot to take in, but that's... Uh, that's what I wanted to say about insight and the selection of ideas. But even if you just take away the idea of the Eureka heuristic, I'm, I'm happy with that. Okay, so now if you take this mechanisms of, of how insight might work, um, what happens if you, uh, you know, add some mushrooms to, to this whole model and, um, uh, and the associated uh, plasticity? What happens to the functioning of this Eureka heuristic? What happens to the function, functioning of these, uh, these predictive uh, mechanisms. And so that's what we tried to address in this recent preprint, pre -print, which is called uh, The Power of Insight, How Psychedelics uh, Solicit False Beliefs. So in this paper, we propose that 
Of course, there's the pre-psychedelic trip uh, situation. And here you have a kind of standard uh, communication between sensory cortex, so low levels of uh, low levels of abstraction, and higher cortex, so high level abstraction, high levels of abstraction, so things like sensory experiences versus thinking. Um, and you have a kind of ordinary balance between prediction errors and priors, where priors are you know, keeping the prediction errors in check uh, because they have certain expectations and, and therefore you know, appropriately weighting which prediction errors, which new information from the world we should uh, pay attention to. Then what happens is you take some psychedelics. What this does is flattens your prior. So we're drawing on the Rebus model here. So this flattens your belief landscape. It makes your beliefs more relaxed. It makes your beliefs more amenable to change. It reduces your filters on the, on the bottom-up uh, input. It decreases the precision weighting of your priors. And what happens by virtue of decreasing the precision weighting of your priors in a kind of natural Bayesian way, you start to increase the precision of your prediction errors. <clears throat> so this is where you start to get more psychedelic insights. Excuse me. Sorry, by flattening your priors, by relaxing your beliefs, you get more insight experiences and during the psychedelic um, uh, trip. And this, uh, over time, leads to novel perspectives. Um, and if you don't have those insights rewired during the trip, then they can be uh, post-trip, the insights and beliefs arrived at, um, now enact increased precision over sense data, such that the sense data now less heavily weighted and beliefs more strongly weighted. So these insight experiences then have transformed your beliefs, right? So you have relaxed beliefs, you get more insights, it's, and that's it's via those insights that the uh, beliefs are transformed. Now, why we've said that it's the risk of why this paper is particularly about the risk of uh, false beliefs um, can be stated uh, pretty simply as follows. A system that is more liberal is less reliant on previous learning. If previous learning is reliable, then the probability of false insights increases. I think this is a really you know, I think this is a fair point. If you make the system simply available to change um, and more malleable, which is wonderful, of course, when we want to fix a system that has uh, some, some some issue or we want to simply experience novelty or we want to see the world from a different perspective, this is extremely powerful. But we also need to, I think, admit that our previous learning is, for most of us, grounded in our sensory evidence. It's grounded in things that are, to some extent, um real you could say or held together by by the world and so when we put away our previous learning and we have a lot of insights i think almost by definition a greater proportion of those are going to be uh false than in a sober state again that might be totally worth it in many situations but it's uh it's a it's a it's a kind of logical risk and there's some some nice evidence that's come out for this uh, uh, recently. So this is a nice double-blind um, placebo-controlled study where they looked at uh, uh, insights and creative problem solving during psychedelic uh, experiences. Um, and what they find what found was so you don't need to look at all the details of of these figures, but basically in the in the alternative uses task, so a creativity task, performance on the task didn't improve during psilocybin. So performance create creative performance didn't improve. But what did increase, and that is the blue bar here, is the, that's where they took psilocybin, is the feeling of insight. The, the amount of insights or the, the strength of the insights increased, but the quality of the creative ideas uh, didn't. Again, uh, aligning quite well with the hypothesis. And moreover, the strongest predictor of increasingly higher feelings of insight and positive changes in long-term novelty were lower levels of within-network default mode DMNF um, uh, uh, activity uh, acutely. And this effect was um, functional connectivity, sorry. Um, and the, the correlation here was very large. And so this is really pointing to the fact that the integrity of the default mode network, these higher order um, areas of the brain, as we've argued earlier, become relaxed. And that is what leads to this increase in um, feelings of novelty and increased feelings of insight. So this is really consistent basically with, with what we've just proposed. So psilocybin decreased the integrity of the default mode network, acute higher order plasticity, which was the strongest predictor of subjective feelings of insight, but not objective performance. 
again, potentially highlighting the fact that the system becomes very liberal to insights, but those may be false. Um, and there are similar uh, uh, findings elsewhere, for example, with EEG. So uh, as um, neural activity becomes more synchronized throughout the brain, meaning more less differentiated, meaning um, you've, you're losing the integrity of these various um, uh, uh, systems in, in the mind. Again, we can point to things like the default mode network integrity, where you see greater synchronization of neural activity, you also get increasing feelings uh, of insight. Um, in this case too. So just to conclude this part of it before we get into uh, all the things about truth and you know I, I'm, I think we're going to hit the hour pretty much perfectly, which is great. We suggest that psychedelics are like adding water to the clay of belief systems. This makes the mind more malleable, but it also threatens the integrity of the system. New forms and insights become more available at the likely cost of epistemic fidelity. And again, this is this is not a negative take on psychedelics. I think it's 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 ex extremely powerful, and the potential is, is magnificent. But if we don't, uh, I think we, if we if we ignore epistemic harms like this, I think we're doing that um, uh, uh, really with with serious uh, risks um, to to people's belief systems and and we we risk things like delusional beliefs and you know it's it's things like this that can also i think create the kind of roots of a, a psychotic episode or uh, yeah a kind of manic delusional uh, period all right let's uh, let's get a bit more philosophical uh, now if that wasn't <laughs> philosophical enough for you already and talk about truth so what i've been proposing if we go really big picture is that insight is an inference insight is a kind of predictive inference about the contents of our own consciousness just like we judge somebody else's ideas by inferring whether it's true or false we somehow have to judge our own ideas about whether whether they're true or false. And in this way, insight is, is an inference drawing on our past past learning and the present context. And of course, psychedelics has a powerful effect on that particular uh, inference. Now, it's not all about truth. So this is a figure we've recently added to the paper, so you'll be able to see it soon. Um, and this is based on some feedback we had, and we realized we hadn't been clear enough about it, but it's not all about truth. It's not all about veridicality. Veridicality is another word for basically the likelihood of being true. It's also about adaptiveness. Uh, ideas can be adapted even if they're not true. I mean, at least theoretically, right? And vice versa. Um, they might be true, but they might be maladaptive. And there's also this question of falsifiability. How, how, how can we even know whether some, for example, metaphysical insights are true or false? Well, given that they're kind of axiomatic often, we can't know. Um, and so we, we might want to focus on whether they're adaptive or not, again, if we're thinking about something like uh, psychedelic psychotherapy. So in this space that I've kind of painted here, let's look at a few insights. And there's also this question of valence. So they can be positive insights or they can be negative and they can be small or less intense or, or very intense. So these are just illustrative examples. They're going to be different for different people, but it's just to highlight that there's this space of, uh, that there's this way of thinking about a space um, of insights. So insight one, I am one with the universe. You know, you might might say that that's a that's a pretty intense insight. You might say that it feels uh, pretty pretty damn good. Um, we might say it's kind of neutral in terms of radicality because we we simply can't you know know whether that's technically true and in what way that's true and all of those kinds of things. Although in some sense, I you know I guess that is is true, but we'll say that for now. But we can also say it's. Maybe it's very adaptive, though, to have that kind of experience. Someone who has a mystical experience seems to heal. They seem to have get a lot of benefit from from these kinds of experiences. So it's it seems to be adaptive, but it's also not falsifiable. It's extremely difficult to falsify, right? So this is where we might put that one. What about the insight that I am worthless? What about someone who just accidentally gets some negative feedback during a trip or during just everyday life? And they have this insight. Well, we can say that that's extremely maladaptive. So we can put it at the back of the figure here. And we can also say that, you know, we don't know whether that's that's technically true. I would say, no, it's not probably true. But let's let's just say that that's neutral on the verticality front as well. Um, it's also difficult to falsify because if you really do believe that, then you can pretty easily find evidence for the fact that I am worthless, just as you can find evidence for the idea that I am 
I am worthy. Um, what about I was abused as a child? Again, we can say that's a negative experience, so that's that's red. Um, and we'll say that that could be adaptive because, uh, or it's a kind of depends. Uh, it, it's adaptive if you can integrate it, if you can make sense of it, you can heal from it. And it could be but it could also be potentially maladaptive. Um, if you can't, it comes a traumatic experience to to realize that, or it turns out to be actually untrue. It could also be a terrible situation. We can say that probably if someone has that insight, it's more likely to be true than not. Um, uh, and so that's why I just bumped it a little bit on the veridicality finance. And it's also technically falsifiable. Just to, uh, excuse me. What about I am Jesus? So let's say someone has a kind of messiah complex insight on psychedelics. We can say that that's... Uh, that's probably not true. So low on vir viridicality. Um, it's also quite falsifiable that uh, that they're they're not Jesus, and we suggest that that's probably not very adaptive either, because uh, you know having a false belief like that is 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 not great, or it might be temporarily for somebody, but uh, probably not in the long term. Um, and it probably feels good though to to have that experience, and it's probably quite intense as well. Um, and just one more example, um, for example, very simple one, I solved the puzzle. So you have an insight that you solved the puzzle. It's easy to falsify. It's adaptive to solve problems. And it's also very likely to be true, given what we know about uh, problem solving and so on. So you can see that you can think about the space of insight uh, in this way. And we can look at other ones. My thoughts are being monitored. I am very intelligent. I am very unintelligent, and so on. So you can have all these kinds of insights in this space and think about them in terms of adaptiveness, veridicality, and falsifiability. Um, and I also have this, we also added this gree bar here to indicate the situations that are adaptive and veridical, right? Ideally falsifiable, but maybe that's not the key priority. Um, and that would be the goal, right? So if, we, if we're having a lot of insights on, in psychedelic therapy, we want to push people towards adaptive and hopefully insights that are likely to be true as much as possible, um, I would say. And so we can use something like, you know, this as a kind of thinking tool to, to know the direction of insights uh, um, that we want. Another thing in terms of future directions that I'm thinking about, just to increase our kind of nuance uh, about what insight is, is um, kind of mapping out a cartography of insight. So insight is, again, not unidimensional. There's many different kinds of insights. I'm not going to go through all of this because it's, it's a lot of information, but I'll just highlight some of the key kind of categories of insights here. So you can have insights that are based in thought. Right. You can have insights that are just like, again, solving a kind of puzzle. So problem solving, creative idea generation, poems or paintings, a forgotten memory, a scientific hypothesis and so on. And these can be increased by incubation, sleep, alcohol, intoxication, play, collaboration, these kinds of things. But we can also have state insights. So these are like altered states, new dimensions and unusual qualities of consciousness. That's a kind of insight experience. It's a non-linearity. It's stepping into a new state of consciousness. Um, and these, these can uh, be occasioned by psychedelics, breathwork, cannabis, uh, trance, lucid dreaming, uh, active meditations, and so on can quickly uh, elicit kind of altered states of, of mind. And, and it's the transitions that are kind of insightful um, if you've had them. But you can also have bodily insights. So things like uh, affective insights, procedural, the somatic and behavioral insights, like an emotional breakthrough, a new physical capacity, a new movement, a new feeling. So if you've done any kind of technical sport there, you, you can probably recognize that occasionally you can have these insightful kind of breakthroughs in, in, in the body. But there's also meta insights, and these are particularly uh, important in the context of meditation practice. So things like deification, deconstruction, decentering, or pacification, the capacity to, for example, recognize that thoughts are just processes. So you're not having new insights based on thought, but you're recognizing that that's, you're able to observe them. You're able to see that that's just a construct that's appearing in mind. You might also recognize that self is just a construct that's uh, appearing in consciousness or the mindful recognition of emotional triggers. So things like meditation, psychoeducation, and philosophy can kind of give us this meta perspective on the, on the nature of consciousness and how it emerges. Finally, there's also transcendent 
uh, insight. So things like mystical experiences, integrative visions of, of everything that we know, awakening experiences, non-dual experiences, unitive experiences, mystical experiences, cessation, satori, uh, kensho, born again experiences, and meditation, psychedelic, shamanic trance, prayer, near-death experiences, you know, can all elicit these things. Of course, psychedelics can elicit all of these potentially in, in, in different uh, degrees. Um, but it's, I think it's really interesting to, to start to map out what is actually the space of possible uh, insights. Now, returning to this briefly, I just want to mention um, here something that's really important for this construct of uh, uh, epistemic hygiene, the, the capacity for us to, to be, you know, uh, well, epistemological and spiritual humility, really. It's the capacity to be meta-aware of the changes in our consciousness and the insights that we're having. So if we take this example I presented earlier, you know, you, initially you have this content of the insight, which is, okay, there's a Dalmatian dog in this image. So that, that's the content of the insight. Excuse me. And then you also have the feeling of the insight. So the idea feels true and pleasurable, the noetic quality. But you can also be meta aware of the insight. You can be also conscious of the fact that I've had an insight and that in this context, I trust this insight or in this context, I don't trust this insight. This capacity to be aware of your insight and to hold them. You know, this isn't guaranteed. Not, all, not everybody has this kind of mindfulness over their own uh, contents of consciousness, but it is something we can train and it is something that we all have the capacity for. And so I think this is a really exciting direction for future work. And we propose that just that's just a secondary inference over precision, over the feeling within the predictive framework, but you can read more about that in the paper. But simply this capacity to be meta aware of uh, insights, I think is a really powerful kind of protective uh, quality when it comes to uh, epistemic harms. So there's a few nice quotes that illustrate this capacity. Um, so one 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 uh, trip report said that uh, I kept having these incredible realizations after realizations about the world and the universe and myself. It was like every great realization led to another one. One, but at the end of every realization loop was the incredible realization that nothing I had just thought of made sense, and I was just on acid. So you can see that this person had some meta awareness as this, this this process of revelation unfolded within them, which is still just as magical, but it's almost even more magical because you're not uh, caught up in the process. And William James, of course, loved uh, to experiment with things like nitrous oxide, and he was also fascinated by inside experiences. And he said, the keynote of the experience is the tremendously exciting sense of an intense metaphysical illumination. Truth lies open to the view in depth beneath depth of almost blinding evidence. The mind sees all the logical relations of being with an apparent subtlety and instantaneity to which its normal consciousness offers no parallel. Only as sobriety returns, the feeling of insight fades and one is left staring vacantly at a few disjointed words uh, and phrases. <laughs> Again, pointing to this uh, similar uh, process of the unfolding of insight and the capacity to recognize that uh, sometimes that's a bit... Uh, bit messy. All right, this is the final slide and a kind of final, I don't know, take home message or a exciting path of future direction for uh, uh, for me and, uh, and I hope for us uh, as, as all collaborators and people who are interested in insight. And it's to do with epistemic foraging and the search for truth and meaning. So epistemic foraging, this is just the idea that we search for knowledge. We are naturally creatures that forage, that like we forage for berries, we forage for data, we forage for information, we forage for knowledge, we forage for insights, because getting insights is adaptive in the long term. We, we, if we get insights, we get knowledge, we, be, we become a, a better model of reality and therefore we're able to survive and we're able to pass on our genes and we're able to self-actualize and you know, reach enlightenment or whatever your goal is, right? Um, and so we kind of are on this path through life, as you can see in this road, and we kind of come across um, ordinary ways to find knowledge, right? In our bodies, in the world, in, the, in our friends, in our families, in our communities, in our universities, and, and so on. And we kind of traverse this path um, seeking and foraging for knowledge um, as, as we go through life. Then sometimes something interesting happens and we kind of get off the beaten path. You know, maybe someone tells us about this, these things called mushrooms where you can have all these epistemological revelations and find all this uh, amazing information, have these amazing experiences. 
And so you <clears throat> take a step off the beaten path and you, you know, you, you, you try some psychedelics. And suddenly, unlike ordinary life where you're just having one or two insights uh, and, and you have to work very hard for those insights, suddenly you're having this absolute download of, of insights, this powerful revelation after revelation, as we just heard of in those, uh, those previous quotes. Um, and what this can do is, you know, back to your ordinary body, your ordinary world, uh, your ordinary professors or teachers or friends and family, suddenly the information there might not seem so impressive anymore in contrast to all the insights that you are able to have during that psychedelic experience. In a way, that psychedelic experience and all this sort of profound access to insight as a consequence of that plasticity can basically, I suggest, convince the system that that is where truth and knowledge lies. In a way, metacognitively, the system comes to believe or may come to believe that truth and knowledge, epist epistemic foraging, is best conducted uh, through psychedelic experiences. And, and this can lead to a kind of epistemic feedback loop where we get kind of caught up in looking for insights in the in the psychedelic drug and rather than paying attention to the information in the world and, and our bodies as, as perhaps as much as we should. And this is exacerbated by the fact that if we're right, then insights trigger a lot of dopamine. And if we get, if we're, you know, we know that dopamine is, is in a way addictive. And if we're going and taking a lot of psychedelics, making the system plastic, having a lot of insights, we're also getting a lot of uh, hits of dopamine. And this can further kind of entrench this loop of uh, behavior um, within an organism, within a human being, where they begin to seek out their dopaminergic fix of insight and revelation uh, in the drug rather than in the world or in this moment and uh, uh, from from the people around us. So I think this is an exciting part of future research to think about how psychedelic effects, psychedelics affect our epistemic search for insights and knowledge uh, beyond the actual psychedelic experience itself. All right, and that's uh, that's it. Right on the hour, I'm I'm stoked about that. Thank you so much for uh, being here and and sticking through this uh, this talk. Um, uh, if you want to know more about my work, you can check out uh, check out my website. I also recently started writing on Substack, um, so you can see my more kind of unhinged and unfiltered takes on all of this and meditation and things like that um, there. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I'm, I'm open and excited to hear your questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you a lot for this really amazing uh, lecture. Uh, I would like to remind that please write questions to the question and answer section. There is at the moment two questions, but we have time for many more, I think. Uh, I could actually start with a question of my own, uh, which relates to this or this last slide you had uh, and about the question like uh, how you think that we could in practice reduce the risk of false insights and beliefs from psychedelics. And I'm thinking like uh, issues such as psychoeducation. And do you know or do you have hunch or do you know is there some research done into this issue that if person has like psychoeducation about uh, how insights work and uh, cultivates this kind of intentionally cultivates this kind of meta awareness could that like prevent false insights also maybe as a wider background i'm also thinking like issues about like what is the social context around the person like does the person have access to like uh, to a community where dialogue and inquiry is possible and also like personality traits like does the person uh, have this kind of high need for cognition and these kind of traits or for me it seems that it's the, kind of the risk for false insights and their consequences it's like very uh, like not equal for all persons or definitely like many things affect yeah, really good question. We actually conducted a uh, uh, experiment looking at individual differences using our false insight tasks. We use things like need for cognition, um, schizotypy, you know, all the kinds of individual differences that we thought might change the proportion of false insights 
that people have, uh, and it made no difference. No individual attribute made a difference, at least in these false insights that we occasion on these puzzles. Now, I, I don't expect that to be true in the case of psychedelics and, and more complex situations. I do think there's still going to be some individual differences, but I, I, I think the fact is that I, I, I suspect that we can all be prone to false insights if we make the system more malleable. I, I suspect that that's the case. I think it's just a question of how malleable you make it. And uh, well, if you're taking off, you're going to get really, really malleable. And so then by definition, I think we're all we're all at risk of false insights. And so the second part of your question is what about things like psychoeducation? What about hearing this talk? Is that going to make you able to better hold your insights or is perhaps something like a mindfulness practice or a meta awareness practice able to allow you to be aware of the contents of your consciousness in such a way that you don't immediately adopt them as, as true. And my hunch is yes, that that is the way to go. And, and I would, that's the kind of next empirical step, I think, for us. Now, I will say that we did also try to warn people eliciting false insights when we did the false insight stuff. So this was another time, and that didn't work very well at all. If we explained exactly how we were tricking them, they still experienced more false insights, um, but a bit less. So a warning basically made no difference. If we explained it in absolute critical detail, how we were eliciting the false insights, then they had a bit less false insights, but they were still having them. So it is it is very tr tricky. So I think this meta-awareness thing is is valuable because it, it might not prevent the false insights, but it might prevent the confidence in the false insights. Hmm, thank you. Very interesting. How about the social or epistemic context around the individual? Do you think that makes a difference? Yeah, I, th I think this is also crucial. I mean, it's, it's things like the relationship with the therapist, if we're talking about psychedelic therapy, but also things like uh, if somebody is in a situation where they experience a lot of solitude and they don't have much feedback from people because, you know, we test our insights in the world, right? Like it's, it's through... It's through our through the feedback in our sent through through our bodies and our senses through interaction with others through our communities through our teachers and having people who we trust to to test our ideas against that we're able to kind of um, take our model and kind of refine it and kind of if we think of like a sculpture chip away at it in an uh, appropriate way we we use the world and the people around us to to help us create a useful model of reality. So I think this is this is crucial. I'm not sure exactly how it needs to work, but I think key here is diversity, for example. If I was going to make a kind of empirical prediction, a diverse kind of diverse human interaction and testing of ideas is really important because even if you have these powerful insights and they turn out to be delusional, but you happen to be in a particular context where everybody reinforces those 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 insights and don't challenge them and you don't expose yourself to any other new groups, I'm thinking about like a cult here or something like that, then you can get caught in this sort of epistemic bubble. And then this can lead to kind of dangerous loops of confirmation rather than disconfirmation. And, uh, and so I think diversity uh, of, of community is, is perhaps key. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of uh, speculating on the fly here, but that, that sort of makes sense to me. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Makes a lot of sense. Also brings my mind the effects internet and the like possibility of like algorithms uh, reinforcing those dynamics might have. But yeah, let's move on. Uh, Ville Salmens, who has question. Would you like, Ville, open your mic and ask the question? Yes. Um, so, yeah, thanks for the, the talk. Very fascinating and insightful. And um, greetings from Berlin. I happen to be um, attending the Insight Conference, which starts today. Nice. Um, ah. <laughs> <laughs> nice um, um, synchronicity, synchronicity here. So um, from the context of um, psychedelic assisted therapy, um, I'm asking that, um, well, you say that psychedelics, and I assume, especially during the acute experience, um, they increase the quantity and intensity of insights and this being key to the therapeutic process and change of beliefs. 
So would you conclude that the the acute psychedelic experience is a key component uh, to therapy, to psychedelic assisted therapy, and something that these um, non hallucinogenic uh, psychoplastogens that just increase um, neuroplasticity, to my understanding, uh, this would never allow this this same level of like intensity of or, or results of therapy. Yeah, that that's a really excellent question and something I've been thinking about quite a bit recently. And I think you're exactly right. I think in some sense, the fact that insight is key to the therapeutic process and the fact that something that wouldn't have the experiential effects that psychedelics do <clears throat> um, wouldn't elicit those insights, then presumably um, the actual experience of insight is key uh, or the actual phenomenology or, or the actual psychedelic experience itself is, is crucial for the therapeutic progress. That's definitely my hunch. I think that's what the research on insight also suggests. And I would say also that if I'm right that um, and, and, you know, it's not just me, but that there's this sort of hierarchical process, uh, according to active inference, of, of, of um, making sense of the world from lower order levels to kind of the metacognitive levels and the conscious levels and even the higher order sort of meta-aware levels. Unless you have um, actual phenomenological changes occurring, um, you're not having changes perhaps at those higher order levels uh, because those higher order levels are by definition conscious. So if you're having deep changes to the mind at the, at the higher order levels of the mind, um, those are uh, conscious experiences. And so if you're not having those conscious experiences, it's hard for me to imagine how those higher order levels can actually enact change. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but it relates very much to the feeling of the fact that the feeling of insight is, is likely necessary. But not only that, but also the fact that higher order beliefs are by definition conscious and so for changes in those beliefs to occur um, there needs to be a, a conscious component to that. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, thanks. It, um, I could say it fits my model. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Mm, yes. Uh, next, we have a question from or, or anonymous question uh, regarding the quote. A system that is more liberal is less re reliant on previous learning. If previous learning is reliable, then the probability of false insight increases. And the comment is, uh, would you say that there might also be an insight to be gained if we apply this observation to politics? Uh, and in best case, mutually supporting or counterbalancing roles of conservatism and liberalism in society. Yeah, look, that's not really uh, my domain, but uh, I would say, you know, that there's there's an analogy to be made there. Um, again, if, if you, I haven't thought about it in that context, but if, if I had to, you know, it kind of makes sense, right? I mean, if you take a system to be too liberal and it turns into chaos, and if you take it to do too conservative, it becomes too rigid, and you might want something uh, kind of balanced uh at least if we're talking about epistemology. But if we, we also take the psychedelic state as a kind of example, maybe you want acute periods of very strong liberal uh, activity, and then you need a, a period again of then more conservative activity. And of course, what that's what we see in the political landscape of the world is this sort of flipping back and forth between a little bit more left-leaning to a little bit more right-leaning. And this, if you make the analogy to the mind, is the epistemic system becoming more liberal, i.e. letting go of its prior beliefs, its prior traditions, its prior expectations in favor of a new model of reality. And then when that happens uh, and then uh, and change occurs then sometimes there's a kind of push back towards integration you could say a more kind of rigid conservatism and, and kind of entrenchment of existing traditions and, and, and beliefs and i think that does provide a nice analogy to the mind and i do think what's beautiful about active inference and predictive processing in general is that it's something that at least in theory can apply right across the levels all the way from very uh, low levels like molecules and even potentially physics, which it's been applied to recently, but all the way up through biology, through cognition, um, up towards social systems, political systems, and then even perhaps uh, things like um, 
uh, solar systems uh, as as predictive agents that are trying to maintain their integrity and, and trying to make sense of, of reality. So, yes, I think these things can be applied across these different levels. And I think the analogy um, uh, to politics is is an interesting one and, um, and, and uh, yeah, one that I'd like to think about more. Mm, thank you. Fascinating the idea that those kind of similar systemic dynamics can appear in very different kind of systems. Uh, next, uh, we have a question from Jussi Julke. Would you like to open your mic? Yes, thank you. Uh, I will just read aloud my question. Uh, relaxation of priors could intuitively lead to the questioning of prior beliefs, that is skepticism. What is the difference between such skepticism and positive insights Insights which are unskeptically perceived as true. Yeah, excellent question. I think the element that you point there again is this: there's an in the skeptical case, there's an element of meta awareness. There's there's one way to have insights; it's all this new content. The other way is to be meta aware and become actually skeptical of that content. And you can imagine that these psychedelics could even boost that capacity if it's if it's sort of uh, uh, built in. And this pr points to that whole category of meta insights that are potentially uh, deconstructive. This is what happens in meditation, right? You become skeptical about the nature of all the phenomena within your system. You become meta aware, you become mindful about them. And, and by, by being aware of them, they can deconstruct in the sense that you become aware. Once you become aware that an insight is just a bundle of thoughts, then it doesn't really do much. It actually deconstructs because it just becomes a bundle of thoughts rather than what could have been a whole new perspective on reality, a whole kind of new window through which to observe. Instead, you kind of are able to observe and be actually kind of skeptical about the, the contents of consciousness. So I think it relates very much there. And I will say there's, a, there's an interesting paper that talks about something called anti-aha moments by Rob Sips. And he's a philosopher who himself went through a, uh, a psychotic episode. And he talks about anti-aha moments as aha moments that deconstruct the worldview. There are these sorts of, uh, all, you could say skeptical aha moments about the existing beliefs, just as you say, not being accurate, right? By making them flexible, there's the recognition that one's existing beliefs are not accurate. And this leads to what he called an anti-aha moment, as the old perspective is simply collapses, but isn't necessarily replaced by something else. And for him, this led to a kind of cascade of anti-aha moments that basically broke down um, the foundations of his belief system, and eventually led to delusions and, and a psychotic episode. So that's also, uh, uh, you know, something that could could very well be triggered, let's say, by um, a psychedelic uh, experience. But it can also be triggered through meditation, things like dark night experiences. Um, and, and also people, when they go on very intense meditation uh, retreats, they can, um, um, yeah, sometimes fall into, into something like, uh, in the worst case scenario, a psychotic episode. But in other cases, this deep feeling of, of dread or or fear or uh, suffering as as the old model that you have been carrying that one has been carrying begins to to crumble uh, in front of us and there's not yet uh, some deeper foundation that's that's been discovered. So nice question. I hope those uh, reflections were at least a little bit useful. And and nice to meet you. You'll see. Thank you. Same. Mm. Fascinating. Also, like uh, shunyata or this emptiness in Buddhist philosophy comes to my mind, or where it seems that that bit similar anti aha process is kind of uh, sought after to kind of deconstruct the worldview. Um, yes. Uh, next question is from Anonymous. Uh, Psychedelics such as psilocybin have been sh shown to increase the sense of connectedness, comprising uh, three distinguishable aspects, a connection to the self, others, and to the world at large. Do you have an idea what might be the relation between insight experiences and this enhancement of connectedness offered by psychedelics? Yeah, I mean, it depends. You, you could cast that feeling of 
connectedness, depending on how it emerges uh, as a kind of insight, right? So initially you, you have a model that says that I am a separate entity, uh, a strong belief system that I have some sort of self behind my eyes usually that separates me from, from the world and even in a way my body, even though somehow I'm aware that this is my body. It's quite a paradox. But you have this vision and then you take this, this psychedelic and then something changes. Those beliefs uh, in the system become relaxed. Those existing beliefs that I'm a separate entity behind the eyes who's navigating this world and controlling, trying to control things, uh, relaxes. And instead, what that's replaced with is the sensory input, the low-level input. And that low-level input suddenly reveals actually that there's this interconnectedness between things. Once you relax that sense of self, this new vision of reality. So you relax one version of one uh, one perspective into another one, um, and that new vision reveals the interconnectedness between, for example, ourselves and 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 the world and and other people. Which is, of course, you know, factually uh, that that is that is the case that we are interconnected. But it's it's. I suspect something about relaxing, especially that uh, self-centered uh, model that allows for this kind of restructuring uh, to occur where we're able to recognize uh, this new way of looking at things where, where there is this interconnectedness. Now, you can also imagine that that insight can kind of, you know, become more and more intense or more and more extreme, depending on how far you go on that continuum. On the one end, you have this extremely rigid sense of separate self let's say, kind of almost narcissistic or sociopathic kind of sense of self. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have a completely integrated, non-self, non-existent kind of goo where there's no individuality whatsoever, no things at all, right? And, and we can kind of, depending on how, how much the system relaxes its existing beliefs or the extent to which it's paying attention to input, you can imagine that it can go any, anywhere along this, this spectrum. Um, and and I, I suspect that you can have these these leaps of insight uh, uh, along along this spectrum. And you know we need some level of healthy uh, self. We might be aware that the self is an illusion, but we still need a self in order to function in this world. And so you 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 know you need to find a balance there as well potentially. So I think insight plays a role there, but it can also happen gradually. Perhaps this feeling of connection doesn't always have to happen in this. Uh, this sudden uh, sudden experience, but the general mechanism of relaxing higher order beliefs, especially those associated with the self, to give rise to a feeling of connection, makes perfect sense to me. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Uh, next question. Let's take uh, from Sonia. Uh, do you want Sonia to? ask the question yes um so hi and thanks for the really interesting lecture some time ago uh, uh some time ago i listened to a podcast where you were talking about this concept of counter counterfactual tree which i understand as the self and world model and you said that certain meditation practices can kind of prune it, whereas psychedelics bump holes in it uh, in a more random way. So I was wondering uh, how this bombing is related to the higher probability of inside experiences during psychedelics. And do you think that inside experiences that are experienced through meditation are more reliable? <laughs> yeah that's a deep question and um a long answer and, and there's a lot of context i guess there for people and i tried to kind of uh, simplify that a little bit but uh, we have also a um a theory of, of meditation that we worked on for a very long time helene slagter and i it's called many to not meditation on the plasticity of the predictive brain um, and there we propose that the mind emerges a kind of hierarchy as we've discussed so it's you could imagine that's kind of a tree with levels of abstraction associated with it right each each level has more counterfactual depth we don't need to talk about counterfactual depth so much here because it's a longer story but each of these could be a counterfactual version of let's say um thinking or or perspectives on the world but as we get more abstract uh, away from our sensory experience we get more and more 
um, into the domain of conceptualization, of thinking, um, and ultimately of our narratives, our, our sense of self and our beliefs about ourself at the kind of top of this hierarchy of abstraction. And so what we propose in this theory very simply is that meditation gradually kind of releases this abstraction. So you slow down thoughts through focused attention, um, and then you go deeper into presence through things like open awareness meditation. And then as you go deeper and deeper, you even do these non-dual meditations where you let go of the very subject-object distinction, and then you can have these non-dual awareness experiences or cessations or awakening experiences. So you can see that meditation isn't about changing the beliefs. It's not about changing the contents of the abstraction tree. It's actually about reducing them so that you can see what's underlying the whole uh, uh, tree of abstraction in the mind, the tree of conceptualization. Now, some meditations shake this up as well because you need to shake this up in order to, to in a way, relax it enough to let it go. But um, psychedelics, what we propose is that psychedelics really wobble this the tree of abstraction up, right? This is all your belief systems, all your thoughts, all your ways of looking at reality. So all of these become increasingly wobbly and relaxed and this leads to what we propose here potentially more false insights but also all those again those positive effects that we were describing but it's also why psychedelics can lead to whoop, mystical experiences and all kinds of interesting stuff can happen right so that's the simple thing so the question is um does meditation by its gradual sober way of doing things lead to more let's say valid and adaptive insights than psychedelics that does this my claim would be on average, yes, to put it simply, but it's a lot slower and it's a lot more work because, you know, you, you might be able to get a lot more insights and a lot more progress with psychedelics by wobbling the system up like this. But with meditation, it's more steady, it's more sober, and the insights are more specific. And you're actually aiming for particular insights that are defined on the, based on the tradition that you're working within. And the practice actually helps you get to those insights. And it's, a que it's an open question whether they're true, but um, my experiences is, is, and my claim would be, is that they're certainly adaptive and certainly make the system more resilient um, and effective and, and they're more reliable. Now, that's not to say that false insights can't happen on meditation, in meditation. They absolutely can. And they, if you go on very intense meditation retreats, it's also a bit like doing a, having a psychedelic trip. You're, you're inducing so much intense new, well, new nothingness, new stillness, because you're used to confirming your expectations through your behavior in your everyday life. And now you just suddenly stop doing all of that. That's also kind of psychedelic to the system in the sense that it is completely novel and it's going to wobble things up a bit, right? Um, so I would say meditation also has epistemic risks, absolutely. But I suspect that those epistemic risks are slightly immediate changes that you might expect on uh, psychedelics. Yeah. But you're likely to discover things that are, I think, much cooler and much more sustainable. Thank you. I hope that answers. Thank you. So yeah. Much. Uh, my my internet uh, skipped just a little bit in the end of your answer, but I, I think also that the, the tradition related to the meditation practice can help uh, with the false insights to well exactly there there you have a kind of again you you risk the kind of cult scenario where you just have people reinforcing false insights but you do generally have like a set of uh, a community and a teacher who's able to to check and make sure that your insights are going in the in a helpful direction and tell you to ignore other insights so this is like really <clears throat> a very common role of the teacher during meditation is basically just to tell the person no that insight's not that helpful don't worry about it keep going keep going don't worry about it don't worry about it don't worry about it but you don't really have that um sort of clear structure within a psychedelic experience and again you know, this also always comes with risks in the meditation context. As I said, if you get into a loop with a uh, unhealthy, uh, you know, system of beliefs, a, a exploitative view, a, and all those other things can happen in that space. Nothing is without, neither these spaces are without epistemic risks. Um, but my sort of tentative answer would be that I think meditation is epistemically slightly safer. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thanks, Sonia. Mm, thank you. I linked the paper to the chat and I highly recommend it. I think it's a huge and deep paper. 
also raises interesting questions about the possibility to, uh, or how would psychedelics function as part of a contemplative tradition where there is like other practices and the guidance of a teacher and so on. Um, yes, uh, we have some, yeah, a couple more questions still. Uh, one from Anonymous. As stated, many insights seem completely nonsense after the trip. There is also the possibility that insights can't be translated to normal state of consciousness from the altered states. McKenna, if I remember correctly, uh, idea was that difference between shaman using psychedelics and common folk was that a shaman could bring back stuff to the normal world, whilst common uh, folk, it was just something ineffable, yet feeling insightful during the trip. Do you think this uh, thinking holds true, and could, could there be a way to increase person's capacity to carry insights from psychedelic state to normal state? <laughs> I love this question. Um, you know, I, I if I'm speaking just from my own intuition, I, I think yes. And you know, I spoke about this this um, cartography of insight, right? So you have the state insights, you have these kind of uh, transcendent insights. And it could be, for example, that you get strange interactions between these. So if you're in a particular state of consciousness, it could be that an insight kind of works or is adaptive and in some sense critical, but only in that state of consciousness. That is, you can only kind of use or apply or express that insight as a function of that state of consciousness. So the state of consciousness is kind of necessary assumption of the adaptive functioning and veridicality in your behavior of that insight. Okay, so you'd, you'd somehow need to maintain, let's say, for example, this higher order state of consciousness in order to maintain that insight as feeling true and actually practical in the world. And I actually do think that's likely to be true. That reflects some of my, my own experiences. But your question speaks to whether, you know, you could somehow access these higher states of consciousness where you seem to have this sort of, let's say, deep mystical insight, but to bring that somehow and ground it in, in, in this ordinary uh, life. And, you know, I think that's a life's, that's a life's work. And there may be uh, uh, tricks uh, to doing that more, more quickly that shamans have identified that I haven't. Um, but I'm really open to that possibility. But I suspect that the real issue is that you need to somehow be able to actually maintain that state of consciousness where those insights are maintaining their adaptiveness and veridicality. And that just requires the, the integration and practice in your daily life. Yeah. A little bit stepping outside of the domain of science. So I'm just going to stamp that with uh, Ruben's speculation. <laughs> uh, Henry, do you want to say aloud your question? I have a question uh, regarding your ketamine story. So on your Twitter account and Substack blog, you shared your story of getting instant permanent relief from ketamine administered in an ambulance for severe long-lasting pain. You've said that this might have something to do with ketamine relaxing bodily habits uh, in a way similar to how it and classical psychedelics may relax mental habits. Would you recount a brief version of the story and comment on this effect and its possible mechanisms and their possible connection to things that you've been discussing today? Yeah, sure. Uh, let's see how we go. Um, so when did this happen? I guess it was, it was uh, just over a year ago. I was in, uh, I was in Amsterdam and um, I was working there doing my postdoc at the time and I was just about to come back to Australia actually, but um, my, my, I have some old back injuries. Uh, I used to uh, do Muay Thai kickboxing professionally. So I, I have a lot of injuries. Um, and so uh, after doing some hiking and combined with a conference in Switzerland, my back was feeling quite sore and um, uh, I was back in, in my houseboat in Amsterdam lying on the couch and I, I was, I, I coughed and, um, and this cough just sent this sort of severe pain uh, in, in my back. Um, and uh, I immediately recognized the sort of nerve pain shooting down my leg as, um, uh, yeah, that I've, I've, I've kind of repinched this uh, herniated disc that I have. Um, and so I knew that I was kind of in trouble at that point. And, and uh, then I coughed again. 
and again, and I coughed again, and and I coughed again, and it, and this pain, this just got worse and worse in a way that I I, I can't even describe. So it, it just kept on sort of pinching this this nerve in in my back uh, to the point that I then couldn't anymore move. Um, uh, and, and this kept on escalating actually for three weeks. Uh, eventually I, I couldn't get out of bed. Um, my leg was starting to go numb because of, uh, the nerve, nerve damage that was being caused. And I was in so much pain that I couldn't sleep. Um, and, and eventually I, I, I couldn't even open my eyes. So I, I was, uh, towards the end, I was laying in bed with my eyes closed in this sort of space right i could even couldn't even really make out sensory data anymore everything was just so deeply painful it was like it was just uh this cough and this um pinched nerve was just it was being just hit sort of so precisely and so consistently that all i could experience anymore was this this sort of devastating uh pain uh much worse than anything else i've had before you know I've, I've torn chest muscles i've broken bones i've broken ribs uh, again from kickboxing so I, I know what things what pain feels like but this was just like on, on a whole other level and again my leg was going numb so you know I, it was really deep internal damage to the nerves that were happening so it's getting very risky eventually we um uh, it was midnight at the time and we decided to call an ambulance um or my girlfriend decided to uh do so and the ambulance uh, came there. I, I didn't. Um, I, I couldn't really speak to them or do anything because I was in so much pain. But they managed to get me on a stretcher. They carried me out into the ambulance. Um, and again, I've been in this state now for gradually getting worse for about three weeks. Um, and as I'm in the ambulance, um, uh, the the uh, paramedic he asked me, um, you know, can I give you some ketamine? And you know, I I, I managed to utter that um, uh, I I probably don't think that's a good idea i think i'm in such a bad state of consciousness that i'm probably going to have a really bad experience if you give me ketamine but he's you know he, he kind of convinced me a little bit he's like hey this 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 could really help um try it and and you know at that point really i was willing to try anything so i said hey you, you know whatever go for it so he gave me uh put in the drip and gave me intravenous ketamine in, in the ambulance on the way to the hospital um and they could obviously see that i was I was in a really terrible state. Um, and, you know, it, it was pretty pretty extraordinary what happened next. And I can remember that moment really clearly because essentially, you know, I felt the ketamine kick in. And then I just felt this like almost, you could almost say it was white, this wave of white, soft, cloud-like quality just progress through my body and through my nervous system really through my whole space of consciousness but it was very embodied so i could feel it right through and that wave this sort of white open space just went through my body and as it went through my body all of the knots like i i because my whole attention had been like on this part of my back for three weeks right so i knew like every muscle around uh, around my spine and exactly where it was I, I had i had that pictured in my consciousness like perfectly and this ketamine hit and that whole knot that whole cycle the nerve pain that was consistent now for weeks just just let go like that the body the the whatever it was that was holding on and keeping that perpetual loop of coughing contraction pain coughing contraction pain just relaxed and relinquished and let go um and as that happened i just sunk into this feeling of just awe and bliss and light and consciousness kind of quintessential sort of unitive um pure awareness uh emptiness sort of uh, quality of experience but the, the 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 power of it was just fascinating to me the fact that something in the body that has been so ingrained for so long and going back so far in my life could just could just be completely uh relaxed like that it was, it was super powerful and i got to the hospital and within half an hour of course i had to be brave enough to try but i had no pain anymore i had absolutely no pain so the ketamine wore off my pain was completely gone and i could walk and i hadn't walked for weeks properly uh at that stage it was you know nothing really short of miraculous in terms of my experience and trying to explain that what what happened to the doctors they didn't really you know 
understand or believe uh, <laughs> how I could have undergone such an intense transformation. I've since, of course, met uh, doctors who work with this, uh, with ketamine or these kinds of um, dissociatives and have, have uh, experienced other patients undergoing something similar to this. And, you know, I do think that has to do with, again, this relaxing of priors. And, you know, things don't just happen on the mind because the mind body is, of course, one system. You have top down, bottom, bottom up and top down processing constantly happening between the mind uh, and the body. And so if you could potentially cast and certainly the active inference model does cast the body also as something that contains um, this, this process of active inference, this process of, in a way, having priors and expectations. In a way, even the shape of the body is an expectation about the kind of world and the, the niche that, that we inhabit. So the body can be computationally construed itself very much in the same way as the mind is construed as a, as a model that's trying to infer itself through, through, through the world and through its actions. And so in this way, you could say that what happened to me was very similar to what's been described so far in this, in this talk, relaxing of beliefs, acute plasticity, insight moment, transformation, except that that process unfolded not only in my conscious mind, but also at the level of the body. Um, and I think this is, this is very possible to happen on meditation. It's very possible, of course, to happen on psychedelics. I have other smaller versions that are never something that sort of powerful, but I've also never had that kind of... Uh, bodily experience before but i did try meditation while i was in that state and that that didn't uh, fix my situation so in this case the ketamine really uh did the trick to induce sufficient plasticity throughout the system to uh, allow for this sort of again bodily uh insight to occur yeah thanks for that henry mm, wow thanks for that story there is one uh, more question do you have energy for yeah, let's do it. Let's do one yeah. more and, and then call it. <laughs> okay. Ville, you can open your mic if you want to ask it. Yeah. Hey, uh, me again. Thanks for this story. Hey, Ville. Very um, <laughs> yeah, uh, inspiring. Um, so as beliefs are de deconstructed, such as with um, meditation or psychotherapy and perhaps catalyzed with psychedelics, so I'm I'm curious what could be um some ethical and practical ways to nudge the belief system toward adaptive beliefs like um I think loving kindness meditation could be one example um and uh, non veridical and non falsifiable beliefs uh, might not be so adaptive in the greater society and I think personally that I have the epistemic responsibility to gather contrary evidence against my beliefs but that still I prefer that prioritizing self-love over universal truth if there is a forced choice. So ethical ways to nudge mm -hmm. towards um, adaptive beliefs. Any thoughts yeah. on that? And yeah, I mean, I, I think this is the exciting research path. I think this is these are the questions we should try to be working at, or one of the many questions around insight, which is indeed how do we nudge towards that green bar in that figure, adaptive and 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 uh, hopefully uh, true insights uh, as much as possible. Firstly, I would say, as I already have said, that we should safeguard uh, against all insights through meta awareness. Um, and second of all, then it's a it's it's partially it's an empirical question against uh, about you know which beliefs are likely to be true, and we we can sort of debate those in in specific uh, cases. Um, but we can we can also it's also an empirical question which insights tend to be adaptive, and we can map out that space using psychedelics, for example. You can you could map out the content of people's insights and see which kinds of contents of those insights are likely to be adaptive uh, in the long term. So I suggest that this is an empirical path because going into my own belief system about this is, you know, prob probably, um, you know, we don't really have the time for that. It's kind of irrelevant on the societal scale, right? Like I have my ideas about what kinds of realizations are adaptive and ethical. And, and I think you point to some really good ones, things like self-love. Also love in general is, is a wonderful direction to, to um, direct things. So if people are having hateful insights, uh, I suspect that that's not going to be very uh, adaptive um, and, and probably not veridical uh, in the long term either in some sense. And so 
I think we should approach this empirically. That's that's the short answer to this question without going to my own belief systems. Um, I think we should start to map out the space, the cartography of insights, as I've suggested, the kind of different kinds of insights, things like bodily insights, thought insights, um, uh, kind of uh, integrative, uh, transcendental insights, the state insights, um, and then particular kinds of insights within that space, and then try to see which one of those, which which within that space lead to the kinds of insights that are adaptive um, and true, let's say, uh, scientifically uh, or empirically and ground them that way. Yeah. Thanks, Dilla. Hmm. Thanks for the question. And yeah, now it's time to start to wrap this session up. Yeah, really. Thanks for the talk and the discussion. Or yeah, this is like super inspiring, and I would like to continue this for hours. <laughs> I actually might <laughs> send you a mail, or I yeah about this like cartography team is like also like very inspiring. Uh, yeah, but we have to find another occasion to continue. Uh, to conclude. A uh, couple of things about PSUTU or our association. Uh, one is that I want to remind about the possibility to join PSUTU if you are not already our member. Uh, there is possibility for people who are involved or plan to be involved with research to become this Varsinais Jäsen. Uh, and anybody can join us, support member. Uh, yeah, and more information can be found on our website. Also, I remind about the possibility to give donations. Situ is uh, financially, uh, how to say it, <laughs> we could have more money, to, then we could make more different projects and stuff. So if you are in such a finances, financial situation, uh, please consider. Mm, yeah, and we are on Facebook, Twitter, uh, and on Instagram, if you want to follow what we are doing. Uh, Henry, would you like to now share the information about the upcoming events? Yeah, we have uh more fashion fascinating webinars coming this fall uh yes i'm i'm not gonna talk this all aloud but there is yeah many many talks coming with matthew johnson san deep nayak david dupuis leo roseman and charles crop and then we have the uh conference coming in November. Uh, yeah, so keep uh, updated and please sign up for the webinars. Mm. Yeah, do you, Ruben, have or do you want to say any last words before we end? Yeah, just, just thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure and the questions were excellent. It uh, got me thinking about a lot of things. So yeah, stay in touch and feel free to reach out if you have any uh, other questions or, or want to say hello. Take care, everybody. Hey, hey. <laughs>